Hi, everybody. Thanks for attending today's webinar. This is very special. I've got my friend Brittany Brown with me. She is the founder and CEO of Ledger Gurus. They've created a very, very interesting and innovative way to deal with e-commerce accounting um, for e-commerce professionals. It's just phenomenal the way they have their business set up. So say hi, Brittany. Hey, guys. So just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. This session is being recorded. Yeah, I just looked, it is being recorded and we will email the recording to all registrants of the webinar. So um, that doesn't mean I want you to drop off because we are totally welcoming questions. The way you submit questions in, is in the questions section of the GoToWebinar panel. We'll take some as we're going through the content, but I don't want to break Brittany's flow. She knows a ton of stuff. She's going to give you a bunch of information today. So if um, if we don't get to your question during the content itself, there will be a Q&A section at the end. We've got a couple special offers for you. Um, we'll be pushing those links out. So without further ado, we're going to talk about growing a profitable e-commerce business. Egos chase revenue, followers chase profits. Thanks, Liz. So just a little bit about our speakers today. Uh, Liz, do you want to introduce yourself? I'm Liz. I'm the e-commerce marketing <laughs> manager at Techometrics and kind of uh, the webinar gal while our uh, our fearless leader, Andrew Weber, is um, not doing webinars right this second. So I'm doing a lot of them. You guys have been seeing a lot of me. So I'm bringing people like Brittany on who know a whole bunch of stuff so that we can keep it fresh. Awesome. And thanks, Liz. And I'm Brittany Brown, um, founder and CEO of a company called Ledger Gurus. I'm also a CPA, but don't hold that against me. Um, I hope to be able to make the topics I want to talk about today really approachable in a way that will really help you guys understand what it is that you need to understand. So I'd like to thank Decometrics for hosting us today. I personally really like doing webinars, and so um, I'm really looking forward to this. I have to apologize in advance if I have notifications pop up, like accounting is my specialization, but notifications and turning them off eludes me every single time, even though I'm pretty sure I shut all my programs down, pretty sure, I swear, they just get through anyways. So this is some of the brands that Tecometrics helps. Um, they help top brand, brands win on Amazon and Walmart. And this and is- if, oh, And if for, some, if for some reason you're not familiar with Tecometrics, we're a SaaS platform that powers Amazon and Walmart advertising across thousands of brands, but we're also offering tons of other analytics and insights as well. Um, and also if you're a larger brand that needs hands-on keyboard help, we have a team of expert analysts that can act as an extension of your business. So we're just helping ensure that your advertising dollar is spent wisely, but we're also trying to make sure you understand where you stand in the marketplace, where you stand in your business so that you can be as profitable as possible. And we're always thinking of new ways that our tools and our services can help you do that. And another way that we do that is through education and bringing experts like Brittany on to cover really, really hairy, interesting, and difficult topic, topics like accounting. And they have a whole bunch of businesses that rely on their expertise. Awesome, thanks Liz. Um, these are some of the major brands that we help. Um, Betty's Rags, Wholesome Culture, Fond Design, Thread Wallets. Um, we handle all the accounting needs for e-commerce businesses. So everything from the, the high level CFO, budgeting, cash flow planning, all those things, all the way down through the bookkeeping, invoices, bill pay, payroll, and we go very deep on channel activity, um, all activity that's coming off of your channels, including Shopify, Walmart, Etsy, Amazon, all those things. We go very deep on inventory and cost of goods sold, and we go very deep on sales tax. So we're designed to be a an alternative to having internal staff or to doing it yourself. Um, what we don't do is we don't do taxes, um, like income tax returns, we don't do audits, but basically every other aspect of your financial needs we cover. So the first thing I want to talk about today is, is a little bit about the title of this course, um, Egos Chase Revenues, Ballers Chase Profits. So most of us when we started businesses, and I speak, I speak as a most of us because I'm also a founder and I own Ledger Gurus, you know, we probably had some altruistic intentions in mind, like I wanted to be able to employ um, parents who wanted to stay at home and still have really meaningful careers. And, and, you know, maybe I wanted to change the world and I wanted world peace, but I also really wanted to make money when I started a business. And for most of us, when we started businesses, we started businesses with those same kinds of um, objectives. We had the same kind of goal in mind. Um, I wanted some more freedom, but I also really wanted some more money. 
And we got into business and we started running with the minutia of it and we started developing our products and we started launching our services and it was all really fun. And maybe we hired some employees and maybe we formed some relationships with some vendors and we started outsourcing our product and doing outsourcing our manufacturing or outsourcing our accounting or forming relationships with marketing firms. We started doing all these things. And as we got into it, we realized that maybe we weren't actually doing the one thing we really wanted to do when we started a business, which was to make money. And the reality is that most of us don't start businesses because we're really comfortable with the financial side of things. Um, most people are not comfortable pulling up open their financials, talking about accounting, talking about cash flow, talking about profitability. And I know this from experience because we work with a lot of business owners and we work with a lot of very capable business owners that are making a ton of money and some that are losing a ton of money. And across the board, the one thing that most of them feel the most uncomfortable with is accounting. So today, what I really want to do is I want to break down for you how to understand the power of your financial information and how you can utilize that financial information to make decisions that will actually allow you to do what you wanted to do in the first place, which is to make money. So yes, while I realize we may be turning you all into a bunch of nerds like me, I can tell you that if you will stick with me through this presentation, like we're gonna talk about some very complex topics and we're really gonna go deep on some things you need to understand to be able to run a profitable business. But I promise to do my very best to break it down in a way that makes it as understandable as possible. And that if you will stick with me, what I mean by stick with me is, I'm sure you'll still all be here by the end of the presentation, but you may start multitasking. You may have multiple screens going on. You may have allowed yourself to zone out. Um, the topics today are complex enough that zoning out is not gonna be in your best interest. And if you will stick with me and not multitask, you will come out of this understanding your financial information a lot better. And nothing will empower you more as a business owner than understanding your financial information because it holds the key to everything. Should I be spending more money on marketing? Your financials will tell you. Do I have the money to open a new warehouse? Your financials will tell you. What kind of products am I getting on my, what kind of margins am I getting on my product? What will my cash flow look like in six months? Do I have the money to invest right now in the raw materials I need for Black Friday? Like your financials will tell you the answers to all of those things if you know how to read them. It is the most powerful resource you have to actually achieve the objective of which you started a business, which was to make money. So let's dive in. This is kind of the agenda of what we're gonna to cover today. We're gonna to talk about the code of the profit and loss, understanding your expenses, understanding your overhead. Um, we're gonna introduce some complex but not that complex after i explain them um, concepts like contribution margins and break-even points we're going to talk about running a business with beginning with the profit in mind and we're going to talk about some key marketing metrics and we're going to talk about spending for sales with a plan now that's a lot of information to cover you might have already noticed i talk really fast which i need to apologize for up front but we have a lot to get through and i want this to be as valuable as possible so hang in there with me so a couple of years ago i was at an e-commerce meetup and I was meeting with somebody, just chatting with someone at kind of like a happy hour after everything was over. And I asked him what he thought, um, like as an accountant to the space for e-commerce, how we could most add value, what people most needed to hear. And he said, you know what I've really learned, he said, is that um, egos will chase revenue, but ballers chase profits. And what he meant by that is this, what I'm showing you right here on the screen. So this screen is a profit and loss statement. And if you've never seen one of these before, it's time for you to learn what it is and how to dive into it. This financial statement I'm showing you right now is a natural generated result of the accounting activities you're doing, whether you're using Xero or QuickBooks or NetSuite or whatever other program you're using, as long as it's not shoeboxes or Excel, um, financial statements are a natural byproduct of what you're doing. At the top of this, you see, this is all the money that we've brought into the business. Then we have this thing called cost of goods sold, income minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit, which we'll talk a lot more about in just a minute. Everything below that is all the other expenses of your business. And at the very bottom here, we have net income. So net income is all the money you have left over after all the money is made and after all the money is spent, what money do you have left over? And this is really what he was talking about. He was saying that a lot of business owners will chase sales, basically. They'll chase income, they'll chase revenue. So I'm, I'm part of the reason I'm introducing this is because you're going to hear me use these terms throughout this. And I want you to know exactly what I'm talking about when I use these different phrases. So income is this money that is generated through sales. And people love to just 
try to grow that number as large as possible. I don't blame you. I do the same thing as a business owner, but a lot of times they do that without noticing or keeping in mind what they're actually doing here, which is net income, which is the real sign of success of whether you're succeeding or failing as a business is actually your net income. So if I was a $2 million a year business and I was doing really great on, on the revenue side of things, but I was not running profitably and at the end of the day, I had no money left over. I'm no better off. In fact, I'm worse off than if I'm a $200,000 business doing a 10% net income. So I have $20,000 left at the end of the year. That is a much better scenario than $2 million with no profit is $200,000 with $20,000 of profit. So what we want to talk about today is how to manage your business to ensure that while you're growing your revenue, you're keeping an eye on profit. That will be the entire objective of today's discussion. So in passing, I want to talk about this thing called cost of goods sold because it's an incredibly important expense for e-commerce businesses to manage and to watch. And basically what it is, is it's the cost of your product. So whatever it is you're selling, um, however much it costs you to buy that from your manufacturer, however much it costs you to generate it or to create it yourself, that is the cost of your cost of goods sold. Now, I'm not going to get into today whether you're going by landed costs or buy costs or all that kind of stuff. Um, not, not important at this moment in time, but just know that that's what your cost of goods sold are and it's the most important expense for you to manage as a business owner. So I have my income, all of my sales, minus my cost of goods sold, gives me this very important metric called gross profit, which we'll get into a little bit more. So remember, income minus cost of goods sold is gross profit. Everything else below that, we basically are calling overhead. Everything below here, here to here, is basically the overhead of the business down to net income. So one of the most important starting places in order to be able to manage your business successfully is to have good financial information. Financial information that's not misleading, that's not um, filled with error, that doesn't just fill your mind with rage and horror when you look at it because you know the numbers aren't right and you have no idea how to fix it and you have no idea how to go about it. Um, we have so many clients who come to us um, when they're originally signing up for accounting services who will say, I just feel like my financial information is not a source of truth at all. And therefore, if you feel like your financial information is not a source of truth, then Creating it as a source of truth is step one. You must feel like your financial information is a source of truth. So whether you need to level up in your own skill sets of knowing how to do this yourself, whether you need to hire better internal help, if that's how you're going about this, or whether you need to find a better um, accounting firm that actually knows what they're doing with e-commerce, whichever one of those options you go with, you basically need to make sure you can get to a point where your financial information is a source of truth. So I'm gonna talk about two of the most common mistakes I see um, business owners make um, or their accountants make when, when tracking the financials for e-commerce businesses before we go into some of these deeper topics. Number one is assuming that whatever they see deposit from their Amazon channel or whatever other channels they're selling on is sales. So if you guys are selling on Amazon, um, you already know how egregiously um, off this is. Amazon basically deposits every two weeks and that deposit is a summation of a whole bunch of different stuff. It's your advertising costs on Amazon. If you're using FBA, it's your warehousing, it's your fulfillment, it's your shipping, plus it's your sales, plus it's all of your Amazon charges. Um, plus if you have like, if they're like giving you money back for inventory that they lost, plus if they are collecting sales tax in some of the states that don't have um, marketplace facilitator laws and remitting it to you, it's all of that in this one deposit. And so the first mistake is taking this one deposit that hits your bank account and calling it sales. Because what that really is, is a whole bunch of other things, a whole bunch of other things. So this is just some examples of what it could be, but it actually the list of like what Amazon could be. And when we set up our clients um, books to basically map from Amazon activities, there's literally over a hundred different line items that it could be. Um, and all of this stuff you see when you reduce all of these activities to one line item, there's a lot of very key data that's missed. Um, you have project product margins that are very skewed. For example, this is actually $147,000 worth of sales, not 109. And so if you're looking at that thing I just talked about, income minus cost of goods sold as gross margin as being the most important metric you as a business owner look at, you've already skewed your margins by just not stating sales right. So this is your cost of goods sold number. This is what you actually called sales. You already see there's a huge difference in that. Um, misstatement of balance sheet activity. So in this particular case, we did have some, um, some FBA inventory reimbursements. Um, 
that, that is balance sheet activity. We also, um, a lot of times people are running um, sales tax through here. Um, sales tax is not an income statement item. Sales tax is also balance sheet. Um, so sales tax that was collected here, a um, little bit less of an issue now because of recent laws, but still an issue in at least three states. And um, if you are borrowing money from Amazon, um, also 30% difference in revenues. As you can see, step one is not calling whatever deposits um, income. Um, I'm not gonna get into all the solutions we recommend on this right now, but you can visit our YouTube channel where we have a ton of information on how to break up activity um, from Amazon correctly. Um, some of the favorite tools that we like, we talk about um, how they work and how they operate. So um, there, there's really easy ways to solve for this problem alone. Um, but if this is the way you're doing it, then that's issue number one is you gotta address that. The other thing we see people, the most common mistake we see people do all the time when they're running product-based businesses is with COGS. So the most common mistake we see people make is that they expense whatever it is they're purchasing for inventory right away through COGS. And this is what it looks like when that happens. You basically, let's say that you have these three months, the first quarter of the year, and you buy all your product up front and it all, the expense of that all hits in January. So in January, we show $30,000 income, we show $45,000 um, cost, and you show a $15,000 loss. And then February doesn't share its burden of COGS like it should, and March is, is home free, skipping through the mountains, singing la la la, because they don't have their share of COGS either. And so March and February both show um, profit margins that are unrealistic, and, and January has this huge hit. Well, the correct way to handle COGS is to basically put it on the balance sheet and then expense it as those items are sold. So this is what it looks like when you do it that way. You basically have your COGS and you expense, you know, this much this month, this much this month, this much this month. As you can see, we have very consistent margins. In this case, we have a 50% gross profit margin consistently month after month. And um, the other thing that is an impact of this that I didn't show is that as well as showing a consistent gross profit margin, your balance sheet also reflects the inventory that is still sitting on your books. So if you're going to a bank to get a loan, um, you have inventory that could be lent against on your balance sheet. If you are trying to sell your business, again, an asset that increases the value of your business. So this is another very common mistake. Um, solving the inventory and cost of goods sold problem is not a small, easy problem to solve. Again, our YouTube channel has a lot of information about things that we recommend on how to get going correctly on cost of goods sold and inventory. But these are the two most common mistakes we see people make. So that addresses the income and the cost of goods sold and how to handle them correctly. And we're going to now, um, every like I said, everything below this is, is overhead costs. So one of the key differences between the income and the cost of goods sold and overhead is that you could argue that there are certain costs that are absolutely necessary for running your business. And there are other costs that are discretionary. And so, for example, I cannot sell a product that I have not produced to sell. I have to incur cost of goods sold in order to sell a product. Otherwise, um, like I have nothing to sell, right? But like, I don't have to hire a lawyer. I don't have to hire an accountant. Don't tell me I just said that. I don't have to rent equipment in theory. I don't have to, I don't have to have warehouse staff. I don't have to, like there's, I don't have to have an automobile that I'm using in my business. Um, these are all things that can kind of be managed and are discretionary, whereas I cannot do away with the creation of a product or the buying of a product if I'm selling a product. So first takeaway I want you guys to take from this is that money, many companies try to sell their way to profit. This can become a vortex of lost money and opportunity. We suggest you spend or rather don't spend your way to profit. Now this um, this concept of, of companies trying to sell their way to profit came from a really great book called Profit First. And so um, some of the things I'm going to talk about today, you could like, they're not necessarily profit first principles. They've always existed, but Profit First does a good job of like explaining a little bit more about it. Um, so basically the idea being a lot of companies will say, all right, we, we have a loss as a business. We just need to sell more. Well, that may not actually be the solution. In fact, they may actually be increasing their losses by selling more. If they're not selling their product profitably, they may be going further in the hole by selling their product. So one of the keys to understanding how to run profitable businesses is to really understand the different levels of profitability and whether or not you should be scaling your current situation, whether or not it is a situation that will scale profitably or whether you will only be putting yourself farther in the hole. 
So I want to talk about four types of costs that we're going to go into in a little bit in a lot more detail. Number one is cost of goods sold, which I just went into a lot of detail on just a minute ago. Basically the cost of your product. Now, um, you could include in that and you probably should, but I don't want to confuse your brain now by giving you assignments that make it more complicated. But I want you to think about cost of goods sold as also including the landed cost. So if you're buying product from overseas, and you have to pay to have that product shipped here, and you have to have pay to have it make it through customs, and you have to pay tariffs and all that kind of stuff. Those are definitely costs of your product. And if you're not considering those costs of your product, you may be, you know, depending on how how wide of margins you have and how much wiggle room you have, you may be finding yourself selling products unprofitably at just that base level. So um, um, this is. I want to tell you guys a quick story that I feel like illustrates this point because I a lot of people just don't take the time to think about this. So several years ago when we first started our business, um, I had a bookkeeper who started working for us. She was a close friend of mine and we were paying her at the time, I think something like uh, 15 or $16 an hour. And she had hired a nanny to help cover her while she was working and she was paying her nanny about $13 an hour. And her nanny would come over for four or five hours and she didn't, she also loved not having to like run errands with her kids. So when her nanny came over for four or five hours, she would usually spend an hour or two of that, like running errands, maybe taking herself to lunch. And then she would come home and she would work for a few hours. So I hope you're doing the math in your head already, but just without like time spent, if we just said time spent that she made $16 an hour and she was paying her nanny $13 an hour, you can already see she only has $3 per hour that she's actually making when she works. So hopefully that's the first thing you guys see. But second of all, as she adds into that time, time that she's paying the nanny, but she's not actually being paid because she's not working, she's now reversed that. She's now paying for the privilege of having a nanny instead of making any money at her job at all. And I remember having a conversation with her where she was like, I thought getting a job was gonna help my family financially. Instead, I feel like we're so much worse off than we were before. And I kind of broke this down with her. And I said, well, how much are you paying your nanny? Blah, 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 we had this discussion. It was like mind blowing for her. She didn't even realize that she was incurring more costs to make that revenue than she was actually making in revenue to begin with. And in such a simple relationship like that, she had forgotten to even do that comparison. And a lot of times, we see product-based businesses make the same mistake, especially when they have, say, like 100 or 200 SKUs. And maybe some of those SKUs are doing really, really well, but some of those SKUs are being sold for a loss. And people have never really dived in and looked at that analysis. And so they don't realize that they're selling those products for loss. Now, incidentally, that's the key, one of the key differences between a bookkeeper, this individual was a bookkeeper for us, not an accountant, is that a bookkeeper coach transactions and an accountant thinks in terms of a bigger picture. So part of the case for having an accountant engaged in doing your books and not just a bookkeeper is a lot of times you'll get a much better level of insight with someone who knows how to think about it from a bigger perspective. But I would challenge all of you guys to think about it, not like a bookkeeper, but think about it like an accountant. So that's the first cost is the cost of goods sold. Cost of fulfillment, cost of selling, cost of overhead. Um, I'm going to go into this next slide to show a little bit more about what this is. So cost of goods sold would include things like product purchases, product packaging, and the assembly. Fulfillment costs would include warehousing, shipping, packaging. Selling costs would include things like ad spend, commissions, marketing, and channel fees. So these are all examples of um, product costs. And when you are running a product-based business, you need to be aware of these products and you need to be aware of how these products behave. And you need to be aware of, um, how much you're actually committing in cost in these different areas. So one of the other things I wanna bring up for just a moment is understanding the difference between variable and fixed cost also. So a fixed cost is a cost that stays the same no matter the level of your business. A variable cost is a cost that goes up or down in direct relationship to how much you're selling. So cost of goods sold is a perfect example of a variable cost. Um, I don't, um, if I have a product and I've for a hundred, if I'm selling it for a hundred dollars and my cost of goods sold associated with this $50, then that cost of goods sold is $50 for every hundred dollars I send. If I sell a thousand of them, it's still $50 per item. It goes up and goes down, um, but it stays it, um, like it moves in direct relationship with the sales. So let me give you a better example than me just speaking this out. So let's take Shopify, for example. Okay. So Shopify has a monthly 
fee to just use the platform period. And it's $29 a month for the basic Shopify, $299 a month um, if you're Shopify advanced, these numbers may be a little off. Um, but basically this cost here, whether you're selling $10 million worth of stuff or whether you're selling $20 worth of stuff, this cost here stays exactly the same. Now down here, we have our credit card rates, right? They, they basically say, this is how much it costs. Um, these are the different rates for um, all the different things that happen. This is an example of a variable cost. So my, my, my payment processing costs are going to be significantly higher if I'm a $10 million business than they are going to be if I'm a $10 a month business. I will have much, much, much higher credit card rates. If suddenly I were to stop selling completely, my payment processor fees would immediately disappear. This would not. This would stay the same unless I downgraded or upgraded my package. This stays the same every single month, no matter what level I'm selling at. This moves in relationship to my sales. As it goes up, it goes up. As it goes down, it goes down. So why does that matter? It matters because um, when you are considering budgeting for your business or how to run a profitable business, it's important to understand whether you're talking about variable costs or whether you're talking about fixed costs when you're trying to plan for your business. So let's take this and just break it into a really quick, easy example, okay? So we have um, costs of one product. Let's say that um, this is an item that we sell for $100, but here are the true costs of my product, okay? Um, it cost me $45 to buy this product, $3 to store this product, $2 to ship this product, and another $10 to market this product. So these are all things that I would consider like um, you can't really run a business, a product-based business, unless you're buying a product, storing it somewhere, whether it's in your garage or whether you're storing it somewhere, you have to then ship it you have to have it shipped to you usually, and you have to ship it to the customer. And then usually there's some sort of cost involved with driving marketing to it as well. So this would be an example of all of the variable costs on this one product, okay? So I have a sales price of $100 and my variable cost of $60, which means I have a 40% margin on this one product, okay? This, if I am selling 100 products, basically all of this multiplies out exactly by 100. $4,500 to buy all those products, $300 to store those products, $200 to ship those products, $1,000 to market those products, total variable cost of $6,000. Even though my even though my sales went up by, oh my gosh, my brain, what is that, 100 times? See, I'm a great accountant, but I don't know math in my head well at all. Um, so my margin stays exactly the same. I still have exactly a 40% margin. So this introduces a concept that I want you guys to understand called the contribution margin. So contribution margin equals my sales price minus all the variable cost of selling that product. So this is what it looks like. In this example I just used, um, here is my sales price. So sales price was $100, total variable cost was $60, giving me a gross mar a contribution margin of $40. Why does this matter? Um, it matters because this contribution margin is now the amount that I have to go towards all of the overhead costs of my business before I will actually generate a profit. So people will say, oh, this is my profit. Well, it's not your profit because if you have any costs over these, which most people do, your salary, um, legal expenses, utilities, travel, whatever it is you're doing, you still have to cover those costs before you actually have a profit. But this contribution margin and understanding the contribution margin on your product is a very important place to start with understanding whether or not you're operating profitably or not. If you are not operating profitably at the contribution margin level and you scale this, you are basically scaling yourself out of business. So first step is um, that first relationship I showed you guys, um, which was income minus cost of goods sold is gross profit needs to be positive. That's barrier number one, right? Second barrier is we add into that now um, all of the other costs that I we talked through. So I'm going to bring it back here for just a second. Cost of goods sold, fulfillment costs, selling costs. These are all the things that factor into your contribution margin. This also needs to be a net positive relationship. So um, sales price minus all the variable costs of selling my product gives me contribution margin. Is this positive? If this is positive, great. You are ready to move on to the next step. 
If this have, is not positive, you need to rework this right away. What were you gonna say, Liz? We have a question from the audience. Yeah. How does contribution margin differ from gross profit margin? Uh, great question. Contribution margin, gross gross margin is typically just um, this. It's just like the buy cost um, and maybe the shipping cost to get it there. That's typically what people consider with cost of goods sold. Whereas contribution margin then factors in um, fulfillment, storing, and cost of advertising. So it's basically what we call the, the true sell cost, which is like the cost of the product and the cost to sell that product um, would be our contribution margin. So and then everything else is the gross profit margin. At the end of the day, after you spent all the money on payroll, on net everything income. else, it's that's the net income margin. Yeah. So gross okay. profit margin is right under. Um, here. So income minus cost of goods sold is gross profit. But a lot of times advertising fulfillment costs are below this line. But even though they're below this line, they're still what we call the variable cost of selling your product. And um, they, it, is, it is something worth looking at because it is the true cost of selling your product. And um, I'm going to show you guys in just a second, one of the best, one of the most useful things for this, which is this contribution margin. So good question. Um, gross profit margin is only cost of goods sold. Contribution margin is all variable costs associated with selling that product. So this is this is contribution margin. Okay, so I'm gonna show you guys kind of what I mean when I talk about the financial impact of one product and how the variable costs affect the net income and how fixed costs work. So let's carry on with the scenario we just used. We have $100 to sell our product. We have one product, we sell it one time, we made $100. We just went through all the variable costs of selling that, which is the cost of goods sold, shipping, um, fulfillment, advertising, we're all $60 giving us. Now I use gross profit here, but I, I should have said contribution margin, said giving us a contribution margin of $40. Now let's say that the business had an additional fixed cost of $2,000 which means that if I only sold one product, you can see I actually had a loss of basically $1,800. Now, if I take that same scenario and now I bumped my sales up to $10,000, I had $6,000 of product cost, I mean, variable cost on product, giving me $4,000 after I basically sold my product. And I still only have $2,000 of fixed cost because now I'm scaling based on fixed overhead. I now have a net income of $2,000. So this is why it's important to understand differently um, variable costs versus fixed costs because all of these variable costs went up at the same rate as my sales, whereas fixed costs stayed exactly the same. So one of the questions people will ask is, okay, so somewhere between one product and 100 products, we became profitable. Where did that happen? This is what you call a break-even point. So clients will ask, how much do I need to sell to at least break even? How much do I need to sell to just not be going in the hole every month? And that question comes back to this contribution margin, which is another reason why I break this out separately over and above just um, gross margin is because this helps you understand what your break even point is. So this is the way you calculate it. You take all of your fixed costs and you divide it by your contribution margin. And that tells you what your break even point is. So let's look at how this works. In this scenario, we just talked through, we have $2,000 in fixed costs, $100 sell price and $60 in total variable cost. These variable costs include cost of goods sold, cost of fulfillment, cost of selling, cost of storing, okay? So this was the scenario we're looking at. So if this is our calculation, Fixed cost was $2,000 minus total revenue minus variable cost. This is incidentally the same thing as contribution margin means that I have to sell 50 units to break even. If I sell less than 50 units, I will be in a loss. If I sell more than 50 units, I will be profitable. So this is where contribution margin really comes in handy is helping you really understand um, how much sales you need to do to make, um, to at least run a profitable business. Anything over and above this, as long as my break-even point stays stays the same, I mean, my as long as my fixed costs stay the same, as this grows and grows and grows and grows, my profit will grow and grow and grow and grow. Anything less than that, and I'm basically coughing up money to run a business. So let's bring all this together. Um, there's two different approaches I want you guys to think about. Now that I've kind of introduced different ways for you to think about costs, 
and different ways for you to understand what's going on in your business. Um, this is what we call the revenue chasing approach. So basically businesses will say, um, whatever I sold, it's still not enough to actually be profitable. I have to spend, spend, spend more, spend for sales. And typically when people are thinking spend for sales, this looks like things like um, hiring more marketing agencies, pouring more money into, um, pouring more money into um, ad spend. Um, it often looks like investing in inventory, um, pre-investing in inventory, all that kind of stuff. And then as they spend for sales, they build up overhead to support those sales. They'll say, oh my gosh, I'm super overwhelmed. I really need somebody to manage this for me. And then they start hiring people or we've totally grown out of our warehouse. We need a bigger warehouse. They'll go, they'll go invest in another warehouse without really considering whether or not they can afford it, how it affects all of this. They just, they start by spending for sales, building up overhead. And then at the end of the day, they hope they made a profit, okay? This is the revenue chasing approach and a lot of businesses um, find themselves in a real pickle doing it this way. Now, there's always the business, by the way, that has such good margins on their product and they just got lucky and they figured out pretty early on how to get a good return on marketing spend and they literally are so profitable and they're basically printing money that they can basically ignore all of this. And, and yay for them. We have clients like that. It makes me wish I owned an e-commerce business instead of an accounting firm. Um, but we all know somebody like that if we're in this and, and it's the it's the thing that dreams are made of, right? Is the business that's so profitable they can basically ignore all of this other stuff we're talking about because at the end of the day, no matter how thoughtfully they manage it or unthoughtfully they manage it, they still make money. Yay for them. Most of the rest of us though do much better when we manage with profit in mind. So what does that look like? This is the profit chasing approach instead. You decide on what you want your profit to be. For example, 15%. I want to do 15% as a business in net income. Then you spend for sales in an educated way, understanding what your return on marketing is, which we're going to get into in just a minute, and understanding what your, your contribution margin is. You make a deliberate plan to spend for sales. Then you build up overhead based on what the current sales level is and what your profit goals are instead of reversing that. So this is what this would look like. If you're using the revenue chasing approach, you basically say, all right, jump in. We're just spending for sales. You basically, I mean, hopefully you've done some sort of analysis on this to at least make sure that you're spending at the sales spend level. You're at least spending profitably. Um, they just start spending for sales. Then as they build up, they build up, they build up. They end up with, you know, a high overhead for the level of sales that they have. And they end up with no profit at all. Better luck next time, right? This is what it looks like to approach it with a profit chasing approach. Decide on what your profit will be, say 15%. Then say, okay, look, we have $100,000 worth of sales. That's great. It costs us $40,000 to make those sales, giving us $60,000 left. I have already budgeted for $15,000 of that to be profit. Therefore, I only have $45,000 left to spend on overhead to support these sales. And they don't incur overhead until the cells actually support the overhead level based on their budgeted profit. I hope that just made sense to you guys because this is so key. It's such a it's such a reverse way of thinking about it, and it's so important. So I you don't math, and it made sense to me. So if if you have a question, pop it in the question section because Brittany will answer it. She obviously knows, but I thought that that was very clear. Okay, cool. Thanks, Liz. Okay, so then um, so. How do we go about spending for sales? So we recommend what I call a data-driven strategy. So one of the things we really like about teacher Tika metrics, and one of the reasons why we, we like them as a partner, is because we're a big fan of anything that gives clients additional information to be data-driven. Because when you are operating a business without data, you're flying blind. You might get lucky, good on you. But most of us don't just get lucky, most of us have to be deliberate. And how do you be deliberate? You are deliberate by using data to inform your decisions. The more sources you have of data and the more places you can get those that data and the more refined that data can be, the more you can make good, smart decisions um, that will actually support you. Um, so the first marketing thing I want to introduce is this idea of customer acquisition cost. 
So basically, this is a pretty this is a pretty straightforward thing. If you're in the product space, you've probably heard this quite a bit. Um, customer acquisition cost is basically all the marketing expense divided by the new customer. So it looks like this. I spent $57 on ads to make four sales. So basically $57 ad spend divided by $4 equals $14.25 to acquire each new customer. Now this is grossly simplified because in the e-commerce space, especially if you're selling on multiple channels and all that kind of stuff, there's like, yes, you got this customer, but then they were like a repeat customer and then they told their friend and blah, 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 blah. Like it, it's not quite this straightforward, but you can make it this simple when you're making certain decisions. So customer acquisition costs $14.25. So then what do you do with this? Then you take this and you evaluate something called ROAS, which stands for return on ad spend. So ROAS equals the average sell divided by the customer acquisition cost. So if my average sell is $87 and my customer acquisition cost is $14.25, then my ROAS is 87 divided by 14.25, which is $6.10. So what does that mean? What does that number mean? This number means that for every dollar I spend on ads, I get $6.10 back in sales. As this number gets higher and higher, you become more and more and more profitable. As this number becomes lower and lower, like if this number drops below one, for example, you are in a situation where you are literally paying for the privilege of giving your product away. You are not making any money on the sell and you are in trouble. Now, this, by the way, this is a straight up cost of ads in comparison to cost of um, co cost, I mean, sales. Oh my gosh, say that again. Words, Brittany. This is straight up just looking at money brought in the door in comparison to money spent to get those customers in the door. This does not factor in, for example, um, the cost of the product, the cost of shipping it, the cost of fulfilling. Um, this is just looking at when we talk about, um, like at the very, let me go back to it for just a second um, so you guys can see what I'm talking about here. Here. Okay. Um, actual cost of sell. This is where we're talking about ROAS here. So on top of that, what we just looked at, you also need to factor in how much my, how much did that cost, how much did that cost? Oh my gosh, how much did that product cost me to buy, to store, to ship, and to sell? And if all of those things are positive and you have a positive gross profit margin, then it is time to scale. Meaning, if you have access to capital and you have a positive you, have, you are positive in all of these areas, it is basically time to start to pour money into scaling. Um, take out a loan, and borrow money from friends and family, um, whatever you need to do, you are in a profitable situation where you can profitably scale this. If you are not positive on this, as you scale your business, you will basically be running your business more and more into the hole with every passing day. Okay, so how much should I spend for sales? Um, that really depends on, first of all, whether or not you're spending profitably at the sales level, but then also how much your basic overhead is. So if you're trying to basically um, scale your business and make sure you're break even um, at least, and then moving towards profitability, um, that's, that's kind of the process we recommend you use. So harnessing the power of your financial information. So this is a this is a um, this is a spreadsheet that we built out. It's on our website. You can download it for free. Um, that basically talks about how all of these pieces come together. So here's the financial variables in the top of the spreadsheet. So let me just talk real quick about where you download it. So um, you go to our website, we have a downloads page. Um, one of the downloads is this thing called the e-commerce marketing budget calculator. And it will actually kind of try to simplify this and make it all like very um, attainable by taking out um, a lot of the thought going through this. So this is how this works. You're gonna start by determining your financial variables. You're going to say um, my cost of goods sold are 45%, meaning that I have a gross profit margin of 55%. Here's my total monthly overhead. Here's how much I'm paying in agency fees for marketing. Here's how many days there are in each month. Here's what I'm getting right now on my ROAS. Therefore, here is what I'm budgeting for daily ad budget. Um, monthly. Here's what my monthly agency fees are. There's different variables you can pop in. These are just some basic ones we set up, but if, hopefully you know spreadsheets well enough that you can kind of play with this yourself. But if not, if you just plug in these variables, um, it'll then give you this. So this is basically what I'm calling the daily profit and loss. So um, I put in my I put in my sales for the day, 
I, I put in this number. Let me show you this. Okay, I put in this number. It will cal calculate my COGS based on the rest of this. So this I put in, this calculates, this calculates, this comes in from above, this comes in from above, giving me my total variable marketing, giving me my total contribution margin. Then this comes in from the from above, broken out by day. This comes in from above, broken out by day, giving me my total advertising, my return on marketing, my total overhead net income. So all you have to do in order to make this work is to plug in your sales number. Um, actually, no, you don't even have to plug in your sales number. Um, you just fill out this and you play with, yeah, actually you don't even fill out your sales number. It calculates based on your ROAS. So all of this calculates if you just adjust these financial variables up here. And then um, it will help you understand what your monthly budget should be. So what you're looking for is you're looking for a positive daily net income. So if these are all of your fixed costs of marketing and these are all your variable costs of marketing, you have to do enough in sales to be able to make enough to cover this, cover this, plus if this is your overhead broken out by day. So if I have a $50,000 monthly overhead, then this divided by how many days there are means that each day I need to cover at least this much in overhead to make this $4,000. So with this video, I mean, with this download, there's also a video where I explain it a little bit better than I just explained it. But basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to give people a tool that will help them understand how much they need to be spending in sales in order to make sure that they are operating profitably, assuming that all of these factors are holding true. So if your ROAS goes down, change this number and see what happens. Or if your overhead goes up, change this number and see what happens. Or if your COGS changes, change this number and see what happens. You'll start to see all the things that are affecting your daily net income. And if you have daily net income, you will have monthly net income. And when I say net income, I mean positive. So if you have a daily positive net income, you will have a monthly net income. So based on this scenario over here, if we have an ad budget of $30,000, it gives us a monthly net income of this. Based on daily net income times the number of days, shows me how much I can expect in net income. Um, I would take questions on this right now, but I think I did a really poor job explaining it. And I think if you download it instead with the video that accompanies it, I'm pretty sure I did a better job there. Because this You one... did a great job, actually. But oh. I also popped a link to that into the chat. So I encourage everybody to go look at the chat. I put the actual the landing page where all of the Ledger Gurus downloads are because man is that some awesome content but i also put the marketing budget calculator direct link to that download page but we do have a question from an attendee love those yeah, <clears throat> where would seller fees from amazon sit in the pnl and what is the agency fee is it to a third party so the um the, those are great questions and it's a question we get a lot which is like where on my where on my profit and loss should these different fees sit so if I come back up here to the P&L, um, right here, um, the the answer is there's not a like an exact right way to approach this. It is more about like it is more about like what your um, what informs you and helps you the most as a business owner. So for our clients, we typically set up as much of those variable costs that we just talked about inside cost of goods sold as possible, so that in a glance, they can see their gross profit is including all of the costs of the sale. So even the cost of goods sold is typically like just straight up cost of that goods sold. We typically set all of these um, above, um, well, not not like the cost of fulfillment, because um, a lot of times that's like, like just to have your product just sitting somewhere is really an overhead of the business. It's not It's not like a cost of selling that product, but it's a cost of holding the product. So we typically um, we typically have direct fees of the channels. So that would be like Amazon seller commission fees would be part of cost of goods sold. But like the fee that Amazon charges you to to manage to just hold your product in FBA would typically be down here in overhead. Um, the cost of like having the product shipped to you would typically be part of this cost of goods sold. But the cost of of shipping your product to your customer may be cost of goods sold you may consider it overhead of the business so um there's there's a best practice that we do but i there are accountants all over who would argue with me about the way we set it up the real answer to that question is set your financials up whether it's above the line below the line whether it's cost of goods sold or a general expense and in order to basically affect that all you're doing is you're indicating when you set up your chart of accounts 
If you set it up as a cost of goods sold type of expense, you can name it whatever you want to name it and you can put in it whatever you want to put in it. But if you set it up as a cost of goods sold expense type, it will be above this gross profit line. And if it's a general expense type, it will be below this line. Set it up in the way that makes you as crystal clear as possible in trying to make these decisions. And, and in general, I would say fixed cost should be down here variable costs would be up here. If I was just like shooting off my hip and just giving someone a general rule of thumb, I would do variable costs up here, fixed down here. What were you gonna say, Liz? Um, and the second part of that question is, what is an agency fee? Is that a third party? And I'm assuming it is. Uh, That's yeah, so this scenario here, we assumed, we tried to build in as if you were like having this managed by somebody else. So like a lot of agency fees like will say, what was that, Liz? Like us, or if you're working with an agency yeah. to help you optimize right. your listings, or if you're working with an agency to help you like blow out your A-plus content or something yes. like that. That's right. the third parties that you work with to make your yes. business. Right, and I built in both of these here. So some monthly agency fees are just a fixed flat fee where they'll just say, hey, this is, um, it's $2,000 to work with us per month. Other agencies will have like some sort of like, hey, our fee is 7% of total sales. Sometimes they're a combination of both. So I built this calculator to accommodate either scenario. So if you don't have a monthly fixed fee, just put a zero here. And if you don't have a monthly agency fee, just put a zero here. If it's part of this, it will drop down here in where it's talking about like um, fixed costs of marketing. And if it's here, it will drop in here to a variable cost of marketing. So this is designed to kind of allow you to utilize lots of different scenarios successfully. But that's Super. what those are. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Kathy who also said, thank you, this is great content. Um, what would be awesome. your advice when you're launching new products? Do you advise to start at break even costs or to have a different kind of plan with product launch? With product launch, um, like I, I would start with experimenting, like what, what you really need to do, like what we guide our clients on doing, First of all, try to figure out how to get as good of a margin as you possibly could on the COGS. So like, if that means like, you know, investigating overseas manufacturers, then investigate that. I'm not saying necessarily like, like you wanna make sure the pro product will sell before you, you know, buy a thousand units from China basically. But you first of all need to get your cost of goods sold as good as possible. So get the costs on your product as good as you possibly can. After that, you need to be able to get it to market as cheaply as possible. So with this ROAS, there's usually a little bit of experimental that happens. Like if you're working with an agency or if you're doing it internally, um, you kind of want to watch this and see what's happening. Like where is my ROAS? Usually when we help our clients do this, we're usually like looking at this over like a long period of time. So this, this is designed to be a planner but it's not a tracker. So like you can adjust this at any time for different variables, but it's not designed to track it. So, um, and I should, this is this is a great thing that I am just realizing that I could have in, included in this. So I, when we have clients that we're working with us on, we basically will have across the top, we'll say like each day. So like, it'll be like, there'll be a tab for each day. It'll be like January, February, March, April. And across the top, it'll have the day, the first, the second, the third, the fourth. And we'll basically, put in the actual data. So it'll say like sales today, marketing spend today, um, blah, 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 blah. And then it'll give us, it'll actually calculate a ROAS so we can see what our actual ROAS is and how it's trending. Like, is it going up? Is it going down? So then when we're coming in here, we're basically plugging in these amounts. We know like if we're way off base, like if our daily ROAS has averaged $2.37, we're not going to plug in here at $10.47 because we know we're not getting a ROAS like that. And therefore, um, we're not going to plug in that amount. But um, we, we track daily data in order to help us understand what the average is, in order to help us understand what the more, what the more reasonable rates are for us to be plugging in here. But if I was launching a new product, that's how I would go about it. I would make sure I got as good a cost as I possibly could and that I would investigate. Um, I would have an experimental period showing me what my ROAS was. And I wouldn't start scaling that until um, I was until I felt like the metrics were dialed in and then I would pour money into it. As soon as I as soon as it was dialed in, I would just go. That's great. And I think actually with that question, you answered the next question, which is do you 
offer all of this analysis as part of your services or is this just good advice for business owners to calculate and i think you just said we factor all of this in so this actual these actual spreadsheets that people can download are kind of an example of part of the tools that your team learns yeah. in order to do the the really really deep dive accounting for e-commerce mm -hmm. businesses so this would definitely be on the cfo side um like as far as the services we offer we go really deep on getting the financial information all correct some of our clients then take that information and run with it themselves some of our clients have us guide them on this this journey from a CFO, we do offer across the board on that, yes. Okay, great. And um, then finally, um, oh yeah, sorry. So, so Robin, Robin, yes, uh, we will be emailing the recording to everybody who registered. Okay, cool. Um, one last thing I want to talk about real quick is is the sales tax issue. And I don't feel like I don't feel like any good accountant can discuss financial anything with e-commerce businesses without bringing up sales tax because it is such it is such a growing and pervasive issue that is the kind of thing that um, you just can't stick your head in the sand about so on this same download page you see we have this 10 steps to ensure sales tax doesn't burn down your e-commerce business it'll kind of walk you through the steps of the things you need to consider as part of like um how do i how do i know you know whether or not I do have sales tax issues. How do I know, you know, like if you're selling primarily on Amazon, most of you probably know for the most part, that means you don't have sales tax issues. But if you also have a Shopify channel, now you do have sales tax issues. So this guide will kind of walk you through that. And then also, most importantly, I wanted to talk about, we're launching a course um, in the next couple of months that basically really shows you how to manage your own sales tax. So we do have a full sales tax department that will like do a nexus analysis, help you make all the decisions, help you understand where you have sales tax, help you understand what your risk is, which states you really need to register on because you have a lot of risk, which ones you can kind of ignore because even though you have nexus there, if they found you and audited you, you'd only have to cop up a couple hundred dollars, help you walk through understanding those, those choices and those decisions. And then we register and then we file and we do all of that. But we're also getting ready to launch a course that basically will let people DIY this entire process from determining where they have sales tax to getting licensed, filing returns, managing inside their QuickBooks file, setting up the sales tax tools and all other things through that. So if you're interested in course updates, um, here's the URL, uh, ledgergurus.com um, resources. I'll actually copy and paste this in the I, chat also. I, I put it in the chat. Oh, okay, thank you, perfect. No problem. Um, if you just sign up here, then you'll just get notifications on the on the progress of that course. And so um, that's something, if sales tax is weighing on your mind, um, you can either talk to our sales tax consultant who can kind of just help you understand some, some a direction on how to go, or you can sign up for this course, or you can just hire us to manage it all for you. Either way, it's fine. We just want to help you guys in whatever way we can. We want you to feel supported. That's awesome. So last, I think this is your slide, Liz. So why yeah. don't you wrap up? Brittany, that was tremendous. I learned so much and I don't understand math, but I understood that. But obviously you are a wealth of information. Your team is a wealth of information, but you've also got a lot of great content on your website. So I did put several links in the chat here. Y'all go to the chat before you log out of GoToWebinar and grab those up, but also grab up this guy right here. This is a link to our market intelligence analysis because we don't want you to spend more on advertising than you're supposed to. Um, and that's a big piece of your success. It's a big piece of your sales, your visibility. So we're offering this marketplace and marketplace intelligence analysis. I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to all of our advertising and all that kind of stuff, but we are in the midst of launching Flywheel 2.0, which is going to offer deeper, deeper insights, eventually some accounting controls, but you still need an accountant, um, <clears throat> access to kind of capital financing, which you might need as you scale um, some inventory insights so that you know where you stand and that's really, really helpful. But right now, uh, people who are using Flywheel 2.0 have access to market intelligence, which is a ton of data that's awesome, but we're for anybody gonna do a free marketplace intelligence analysis that's gonna give you some insight into your comp competitors insight into organic and paid product ranking by search term brand share of voice and all that kind of stuff to help you make, make good decisions about your advertising so that your ROAS is not completely 
screwing up that wonderful spreadsheet the ledger guru is generating for you so i encourage you i just popped that into the chat i'm going to pop it one more time it is totally free and it's totally worth doing and as you're thinking about this i mean it's almost tax season so obviously you're going to want to take Brittany's course her team's going to provide some content that we're going to be pushing out to you guys too to get you ready for that i think that the federal deadline is extended a month but that's not very much time and it's almost april so <clears throat> i encourage you this if, if ever was a time to get your ducks in a row now is the time to wrangle your ducks right true truth yes so um you can contact us through our website ledgergurus.com there's a there's a call button there's also a if, if you email i get if you fill out the form like if you go on and say contact us and you fill out the form and you i get all the notifications um, when people fill out those forms and so you can just put in there like hey saw your presentation you can kind of ask what your questions are if i can answer them quickly i will if not we can jump on a call we can give you pricing on any of our packages from just basic accounting support all the way up through all that other stuff we talked about. So this was really fun, Liz. Thanks for letting me be You're part of it. You're awesome. This. And also, y'all, why do math yourself? I hate math. <laughs> They'll do the math for you. Win-win. Win-win. Win. Thank you so much. We'll see you again soon. If you have questions for Brittany, contact her team. Go to their website, ledgergurus.com. Download some of that awesome content. Look out for some content on the Take a Metrics blog soon, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye.